Let's start where we left off in the last lecture, noting that the biological species definition is often impractical. For example, you can't use it to define species known only from fossils. And you also can't use it for asexual life forms. And this includes bacteria, which are the most abundant form of life on the planet. Asexual organisms never exchange genes. And this is kind of a problem when your definition of a species depends on the ability or inability to exchange genes. This means that the biological species definition can't be used at all on the vast majority of life that's ever existed on Earth. Still, the biological species concept is central to our understanding of an evolutionary process that is very important in life's history, cladogenesis, driven by speciation in which one lineage splits into multiple distinct lineages. Each time this happens, the isolation of the gene pools means that the two species that separate one from the other are going to remain distinct forever and always, the genome of each never again sending as much as a picture postcard to the other genome. This last bit turns out to be not exactly true, but we'll get to this point later. The thing I want you to think about here is what must actually happen in order for speciation to occur. What is it that actually evolves? Here are two populations evolving independently on separate islands. After 600 generations of isolation, they're still part of the same gene pool. Speciation has not yet happened. After 800 generations, they are now distinct gene pools. Speciation has happened. There is something that's different about the population after the speciation event relative to before. Evolution has happened, but what exactly evolved? Yes, the answer is reproductive isolation, an evolved state of one or both of the species that have just become two distinct species. In this new state, the two gene pools are unable to interbreed. In your textbook, you'll find the standard classification of reproductive isolating mechanisms into two types. You can have prezygotic reproductive isolation, which obviously is something that would have to prevent the occurrence of a zygote. And there's also postzygotic reproductive isolation, which of course happens at some point after the formation of the hybrid zygote between the two species. The hybrid forms, but dies without carrying genes from one species into the other, either because of weakness, we call this hybrid inviability, or because the hybrid is sterile, hybrid sterility. A mule is the standard example of the latter. The hybrid between a horse and a donkey is a fine animal. Personally, I think they're a lot nicer in disposition compared with either of the parental species. But being completely sterile, a mule can't make babies with either horses or donkeys, and therefore, even though it carries the genes of both species, it's a hereditary dead end for those genes. The horse species remains pure horse with only horse genes, and the donkey species remains pure donkey with only donkey genes. By virtue of the mule sterility, there's post-zygotic reproductive isolation between horses and donkeys, and thus horses and donkeys are distinct as biological species. Now, if a hybrid embryo forms but dies before birth, or the hybrid is born but is weak and dies before reaching maturity, this would be hybrid inviability. I'll ask you to Google up some real-world examples of this for our live meeting, and also some other non-mule examples of hybrid sterility. Prezygotic reproductive isolation can occur in many different ways and does not require any postzygotic issues. Often you can make hybrids under artificial conditions that are perfectly viable and fertile. In marine species that use broadcast spawning, where sperm and egg are spewed into the water column in mass, there needs to be some mechanism to prevent cross-species fertilization, right? Well, there could be temporal isolation, where one species releases short-lived gametes at noon and the other at 6 p.m. Or there could be chemical markers, for example, where the eggs of species X attracts only species X sperm. In the case of plants, 
If you pollinate a flower with a mixture of pollen from many different species, only the pollen of the flower's own species will actually grow into a pollen tube and deliver the sperm to the flower's ovule. In all of these cases, sperm and egg are actually there, basically at each other's doorstep, but the zygote never forms. Prezygotic reproductive isolation. It could also have a basis in an animal's behavior. In animals that copulate to transfer sperm from male to female, or for seahorses and midwife toads, transfer eggs from female to male. Anything preventing mating would do the trick. Again, there could be some temporal isolation. The two populations of rainbow trout living in Crawley Lake in the eastern Sierra Nevada is a great example. You have one strain of fish that migrate upstream to spawn in the spring, while the other kind, also rainbow trout, spawns in the fall. You can have ecological isolation. There's a great example of this in Northern California. On the shores of Eagle Lake, there are two forms of garter snake, an aquatic type that lives and hunts and mates in the water, and a terrestrial type that lives and hunts and mates in the grass. Walking along the lake shore, you come across both types living around, but given their habits, there's little chance that you'll ever get a hybrid between the two types, unless here to put them together in captivity. Now, if you do cross them in the laboratory, you get perfectly healthy baby snakes that grow into fertile hybrids. So, are these two kinds of garter snake the same species or different species, and why? What about the trout example? Well, the biological species concept requires that the two types remain as distinct gene pools under natural conditions. And therefore, since the artifice of laboratory conditions is required in order to make these hybrids, the two snakes are different biological species. Similarly with the trout, the spring mating fish never cross with a fall mating fish, and so they too are distinct biological species, even though in both of these cases, they have not been classified as such. Both snakes are Thamnophis elegans. Both fish are Ancorhynchus mycus. Female choice-driven sexual selection might also result in prezygotic mating barriers between species. If in my pond, the female frogs decide to favor big, bulgy eyes, the males will evolve to have more and more extremely bulgy eyes, right? And the females will reach a point where extremely bulgy eyes are a requirement for mating. Now over in the next pond, the females might find a different character to be sexy, maybe big hands. And so the males in that population are selected to have extreme hand size, while the females there ultimately come to require oversized hands. At that point, if the two frog populations were to come together, the two gene pools would remain distinct because of the female preferences. Females of the big eye species would refuse to mate with the big hand males, and the females of the big hand species would refuse to mate with the big eye males. Okay, this example is kind of silly, but Ken Kaneshiro of the University of Hawaii has suggested that this accounts for at least some of the rapid speciation taking place in the Hawaiian fruit fly assemblage that we talked about earlier. Two species on the Big Island of Hawaii, Drosophila sylvestris and Drosophila heteronura, differ little in their genetic sequences, at the same level that you would expect for flies in the same species, but maybe different subspecies. And yet, they live in sympatry and remain isolated as gene pools because of female mating preferences. In Drosophila heteronura, the males have this unusual head morphology that apparently drives the heteronura females wild. These same females are completely indifferent to the males of Drosophila sylvestris, which have a more normal fly-like head. Meanwhile, the females of sylvestris refuse to mate with the hammer-headed heteronura males, the ones that are found so sexy by the heteronura females. So getting back to the question at hand, what exactly has evolved when the two species are officially separate by the biological species definition? Well, reproductive isolation. And this can take any of multiple forms. Prezygotic, postzygotic, 
there's no single thing that evolves to make two species qualify as having speciated. But what drives the evolution of reproductive isolation? Well, nothing really drives it. The two populations just evolve in whatever ways they do. Eventually, they get to a point where they qualify as distinct species. Now, the forces underlying their changes, though, would have to be a combination of three of the microevolutionary forces, natural selection, random genetic drift, and mutation. The fourth microevolutionary force, migration gene flow, is most definitely not going to contribute to the evolution of reproductive isolation. Why? I'm glad you asked. Let's go back to our populations that are still the same biological species at generation 600, but different species at generation 800. Let's also say that this is what happens in complete isolation, no migration from one population to the other. How would a small amount of migration between these islands affect the process of speciation? Well, you say, if the two are exchanging migrants even a little bit, this would keep the populations genetically more similar to each other and therefore slow the process of them evolving to become different from each other. And so migration slash gene flow slows or might even act to prevent speciation from occurring. And you'd be exactly right. Little to no gene flow is a required condition for allopatric speciation. With more gene flow, populations will tend to remain reproductively compatible and less likely to speciate. Does that make sense? Allopatry is important for allopatric speciation because the geographical isolation means that there will be limited, perhaps no, gene flow occurring over the duration in which reproductive isolation evolves. The opposite of allopatry is sympatry. Sin, together, and patria homeland. And so if allopatric speciation is the evolution of reproductive isolation when the populations are separated in space, in allopatry, then sympatric speciation would have to be the evolution of reproductive isolation when the two populations that are speciating live in the same place, that is, in sympatry. Do you see the inherent problem, the reason why sympatric speciation shouldn't occur? With sympatry, there are no barriers to gene flow, and the main thing that allows the evolution of differences to accumulate between the two separating factions in allopatric speciation, it's just not there. It would be like two islands that were freely exchanging lots of migrants every generation. We just said that if you had even a little bit of migration, that could basically shut the door on speciation. High rates of gene flow, like what you would have in the absence of a geographical barrier, should make speciation impossible, right? Well, yeah, allopatric speciation is impossible without allopatry. But now we need to leave that box of allopatric speciation in discussing potential other mechanisms that might allow two species to split away from each other without there being any geographical isolation. Sympatric speciation. One means by which speciation might occur without geographical barriers would be if you had disruptive selection coupled with positive assortment, the form of non-random mating where like mates with like. We've talked about this before. In an earlier lecture, we discussed why disruptive selection alone would not make a bimodal distribution of phenotype. But if you added non-random mating, then a bimodal distribution could result. The idea is relatively straightforward. If selection favored small beaks and large beaks while the medium-sized beaks did poorly, this would be disruptive selection. If the small beak birds tend to mate preferentially with other small beak birds, and if the large beak birds tended to mate preferentially with other large beak birds, then you'd end up with a population of small beaks and a population of large beaks that should remain distinct as long as the disruptive selection and non-random mating tendencies were sustained. If it ever reached the point where the positive non-random mating became the rule of law, this would basically be sympatric speciation. But 
what else did we say about disruptive selection? Oh yeah, it should not be a very common occurrence because it requires that the species have an average phenotype which is worse than the extremes. Now if you had a stable environment and populations had a history of adaptive changes in that environment, then populations in general should either be at a phenotypic optimum and therefore under stabilizing selection, or they should still be evolving by microevolutionary steps in a direction determined by the fitness surface, that is, under directional selection. Disruptive selection shouldn't happen unless, as we said, there was a recent change in environmental conditions causing a population to find itself with the absolute worst average phenotype. And such changes should be rare in a generally stable world. Disruptive selection is rare. And now we're adding another special condition to that, positive non-random mating. And this should make the conditions for this type of sympatric speciation to be vanishingly rare. Vanishingly rare is not the same as non-existent. There are a handful of great examples of just this type of sympatric speciation. And maybe the best of these involves the apple maggot fly, Ragolitis. Google up Ragolitis sympatric speciation to get the details of the story. The garter snake example that I shared with you earlier might be another case. The snakes can adapt for aquatic life or for terrestrial life, and being in between makes you worse off when it comes to fitness. Living in the water means mating in the water, while living in the grass means mating in the grass. Now I won't go so far as to say that this kind of speciation is important, Examples of allopatric speciation probably outnumber this kind of situation a thousand to one. I'd like you, though, to be able to apply basic principles to reason why sympatric speciation should be so rare in comparison with allopatric speciation. What are the requirements for allopatric speciation again? What are the requirements for sympatric speciation? Which set of conditions is easier to achieve? Okay, there is, however, one form of sympatric speciation of great evolutionary importance. But our interest here, ultimately, has more to do with its long-term impact on the species lineage and less to do with the actual event of speciation. But we need to start with the mechanism. It's a little bit funky. It involves the duplication of the whole genome, or polyploidy. Sexual organisms, as you probably know, tend to be mostly diploid, 2N. One set of N chromosomes from each parent come together at fertilization to make a diploid cell containing 2N chromosomes. For humans, N is equal to 23. 23 chromosomes in mom's egg, 23 in dad's sperm. 2N is equal to 46. That's the number of chromosomes that you have in each of your cells. This is normal. Now, if by some weird error in meiosis, you had an egg that formed with all 46 chromosomes rather than the usual 23, probably because of a rare non-disjunction event, which is a failure of the chromosomes to separate at anaphase. And if that egg were fertilized by a sperm cell that also had 46 chromosomes, because it too was a product of a non-disjunction event, the resulting zygote would have four complete sets of chromosomes. It would be tetraploid, 4N, and there would be 92 chromosomes in each cell. Now, you might be aware that if you tinker with chromosome number by adding an extra chromosome, we call this aneuploidy. All the cells end up with one more than the normal 46, and the result is generally not so great, usually lethal. In humans, aneuploid babies mostly die before birth, though sometimes, as with either the sex chromosome or the little chromosome 21, that would be the case with Down syndrome, it can be tolerated, though the child is usually weakened. Polyploidy is different. It turns out that tinkering with chromosome number is tolerated much better when there's a complete balanced set of extra chromosomes rather than a single extra chromosome. Being 3N and 4N is tolerated pretty well by most vertebrates. I'm not aware that this has ever been tested with humans, but it would not surprise me terribly if you told me that tetraploid humans with 92 chromosomes are both viable and fertile. 
But if you as a diploid were to bear a tetraploid child, your baby would be a different biological species, reproductively isolated from your species. Each of their cells would have 92 chromosomes, so after meiosis, their gametes would have half of that, 46, right? And so if they were to mate with a typical diploid human whose gametes are the normal haploid n is equal to 23, their offspring would be triploid, 3n, equal to 69 chromosomes. And although this triploid would most likely be viable, it would also be sterile. Meiosis fails when there's an odd ploidy number. The tetraploid is fertile because it can split its even number of chromosomes perfectly during meiosis. This is not possible for triploids in which there's an odd number, three, of each chromosome. What I'm saying is that you as a diploid would be a different species from your tetraploid baby by virtue of post-zygotic reproductive isolation. Moreover, this new species arose in the complete absence of any geographical barrier, and therefore this is an example of sympatric speciation. Now this should seem far-fetched. Given that the non-disjunction error is very uncommon, it must be astronomically uncommon for the rare diploid egg to be fertilized by an equally rare diploid sperm cell. I will point out, though, that there is a second pathway to polyploidy that doesn't require two independent non-disjunctions, and this is probably much more common. It starts with a cross between two diploid biological species. Now, post-psychotic reproductive isolation would usually cause this hybrid to die. But if the hybrid zygote were to undergo a mitotic non-disjunction event, then it would have a complete diploid set of chromosomes from both parental species. It would also be a tetraploid. It would be like if a horse-donkey zygote formed but then non-disjunction doubled the chromosome number before the first cell division. The resulting tetraploid mule would probably be both viable and fertile. Now this mechanism still requires two independent events, hybridization and non-disjunction. But there are plenty of situations where biological species overlap in range and interspecies crossing is quite common. So at least one of the required conditions is not so restrictive. The other problem to consider is that if this were somehow to happen, for example, if you ever got that tetraploid mule we just talked about, it might be fertile, but it would also be alone. With no other tetraploids to make tetraploid babies with, it could only mate with diploids of the parental species, and that would lead to sterile triploids. The tetraploid would almost certainly die without ever encountering a compatible mate, one with the same chromosome number. All in all, you'd have to say that founding a new species through polyploidy has got to be extraordinarily rare. I totally agree with this. Definitely, this kind of thing has to be very rare. Maybe a bit less rare in plants. Why? Well, two reasons. Plants are often hermaphroditic. So, if a tetraploid plant were to arise among diploid parents, it might be able to reproduce sexually with itself through self-fertilization. Plants are also able to reproduce asexually through propagation, like where little plants sprout up from the base of the mother plant. It's really not that much of a problem that the first tetraploid is initially alone in the world. By cloning itself, the original tetraploid would have a relatively easy time making partners with the same chromosome number. The second reason is that plants are sometimes subject to artificial selection by humans. Polyploidy in plants tends to result in characteristics that are valued by human selectors. Larger plants overall, but much larger flowers, fruits, and seeds. Since the time that humans started collecting edible wild plants to grow in their gardens, polyploid mutations have been selectively cultured. And when you look inside the cells of most modern domesticated crop plants, they are recent polyploids with chromosome numbers that are double or quadruple or more relative to the closest wild relatives. Those big, juicy strawberries you enjoy are probably octopoid, or 8N, having undergone two whole genome duplications since the time that it was a wild, small-fruited plant. <laughs>
In addition to tetraploid and octaploid, you'll find hexaploids, 6N, and dodecaploids, 12N, among human-selected crop plants. We have known this much for decades, but the facts that polyploidy is possible and that it's common in cultivated strains of plants doesn't make it an important evolutionary process. In fact, up until recently, most evolutionary biologists would have dismissed polyploidization as a trivial occurrence of minimal interest. This is a reasonably good breaking point. We'll come back to put the modern spin on whole genome duplications as potentially a very significant mechanism of change in evolution. 